Welcome everyone. Thanks to everyone who is joining us live on Zoom and on Facebook for this event. I'm going to pass it off to our opening performance by Sunday Ajax. Sunday is a local motivational speaker, activist, and student at Western University studying social justice. This data is supported by the London Arts Council through their London Arts Live program. Hey everyone, um, I hope you've been having an amazing morning. Um, like Sing Wong said, my name is Sunday Jack. And yes, I do mean Sunday like the day or like the ice cream, whichever you prefer, I will answer to both. This music that you hear in the background is just a really relaxing sound. I love speaking over sound. So hopefully you enjoy as much as I enjoy it. Um, now, if there's one thing that I want you to know about me is that I ask a lot of questions and equally as much I love answering questions. I was once taught that questions are much more than what we think them to be. Questions are an experience. Metaphorically speaking, answering a question is the removal of the unknown that is then filled with knowledge. And when we think about it, it is through questions that make us who we are. You are this incredible person now because as a child, you asked questions. You didn't know any better. Innately, innately, you were, cur you were curious about the world. So you asked about it. Now humanity has also done the same. In our infancy, we knew nothing. But as we aged, we have become this intelligent being that we are now all because we decided to ask questions, but not questions of others, questions of ourselves. So I pose this question onto you. If there was one thing about this world that you could change, what would it be? For me, it would be our perception. Not in the sense of self-appreciation, but in the actuality of what we perceive to be important. It seems as if with every new discovery, we get one step closer to our destruction. A great man once said, the only true test of knowledge is the good that you leave behind for others. And from the looks of it, we haven't left too much. This generation has been swept with a false sense of intelligence. We're so caught up in the pursuit of commodities that we have yet to stop and ask the most important question of all. How much longer can we last? It seems that we have collectively decided to ignore the obvious implications that this planet cannot sustain our level of consumption. And the irony is not in what we do, it's in what we don't do. For years, we have blatantly walked towards our own self-destruction, knowing that this course of action means the downfall for mankind. But instead of pumping the brakes or at least changing direction, we have seemingly put our foot on the gas. We are indeed not that many steps closer to preventing global climate change even decades after realizing that this is the greatest problem that this planet will ever face. Forget nuclear missiles, forget World War III, or even COVID-19. Climate change is the worst of them all. And honestly, I could go on and on about what humans can be. 
But in reality, human beings are many things. But perfect is not one of them. We have flaws. So, so many flaws. We are violent. We're selfish. We're lazy. We're ignorant. And above all, we're divided. I mean, here we are living on a planet that is dying beneath our feet and we do absolutely nothing about it. And if not nothing, then no one near as we should. And honestly, I understand. I get it. You're too busy going to school, getting a job, getting married, creating families, and doing everything you possibly can to make your own life the best it could be, as you should. However, not many people are able to stop what they're doing for just one second, step back and realize just how sad our world can be. And I don't say this to make you second guess the way you live life. This is me asking questions. Because the last time I checked, humanity is defined as human beings collectively. Collectively, not selfishly. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but listen to me very closely when I say this planet is dying. The trees are dying. The oceans are dying. Wildlife is dying, the air is unbreathable, and the food is unsustainable. 14 billion pounds of pollution are dumped into the ocean every single year. One million sea creatures will die from congesting plastic in the next 12 months. Every 60 seconds, in one minute, 55,000 trees are cut down. To put that in numbers or into perspective, that's about 48 football fields every second. And keep in mind, I've been speaking for seven minutes now. That's an incredible amount of trees. Hundreds of thousands of people in the global south will become climate change refugees. They will lose their homes. They will lose their cities. And it will be years for anyone in the global west to truly understand so let me tell you right now, this planet is finite. Her resources are finite. If this life is left unchecked, then this life will cease to exist. See, I don't know how many times you need to hear it for you to finally understand life is just as beautiful as the earth that we live on and equally as complex. The balance that we have here cannot ever be replicated. It cannot ever be found again. It can't even be seen in our solar system. And just for that, it deserves to be protected. So I am begging you, <laughs> I am begging every single one of you, to every politician, to every celebrity, every company, every CEO, every regular person working at nine to five, we need to change. And we need to change now. The next 12 years will be the most important and crucial years in the history of mankind. Because what we decide to do as a race will literally mean life or death. We can either die together or we can live together. And I don't know about you, but I want to live. I choose to see this battle to the end. Climate change is not unbeatable. I choose to be a part of making this happen because a great man once said there are three types of people in this world
I know that to be true because 50 years ago as a black man I wouldn't be able to be talking here today so that lets me know it doesn't matter the challenge we face we can persevere we can adapt and we can make change I believe that this generation has yet to leave their mark on history but that all comes down to you. So if anything, take pride in what we do here today and come to realize that in a few decades when we finally overcome climate change, which we will, that you had a hand in that. That you just being here today is your scream from the rooftops. The work that the London Environmental Network does is a testament to what we are able to do as a race, as a generation, as a group together. Because together, we need to decide how much this planet means to us. Together, we can be the generation that saved planet Earth. Together, we can live a life that is free and sustainable. Together, we can make change and redefine what it means to be a human. Together. Because if we don't, then together, we will lose this beautiful place that we call home. So for me, I thank you. Thank you for your tireless work. Thank you for being able to stand up as an individual and say, I will be a part of this fight. I will fight for the environment because not many people will. So for that, I thank you. Thank you, Sunday. For anyone who wants to learn more about Sunday's work, please check out his social media channels on this slide here and in the chat. And welcome to everyone who has joined us. I'm Simran, event support volunteer with the London Environmental Network. Now that it is 12 p.m., we will be starting the session with welcome and land acknowledgement from Joanna Kerr of the London Public Library. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so my name is Joanna and I am a librarian here at London Central Library. Uh, one of the books, uh, of course, I had to mention today is Ellen Kelsey's book, Hope Matters, which has just arrived in the library for borrowing and is also available to borrow as an ebook or e-audiobook read by the author, which I love, in the library's Hoopla collection. Uh, and since this is an event for adults and youth, uh, I also wanted to mention another book that has just arrived in our collection. Uh, How to Change Everything by award-winning author and climate activist Naomi Klein. This book includes inspiring profiles of young people around the globe who are making a difference. So before starting our program tonight, uh, today, I should say, before starting our program today, uh, we would like to take this time together to acknowledge that we in London, Ontario, 
are speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lunapeyuk, and neutral peoples. This land is covered by several treaties, including Treaty 6, the London Township Treaty of 1796. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank the generations of peoples who have taken care of this land. Together and going forward, may we all recognize our own responsibility in the stewardship of this land. If you would like to read or learn more about Treaty 6, the library holds materials on this and other treaties. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll start our program now. Thanks so much, Joanna. Now we'll be getting into today's session, Hope Matters, Tackling Eco-Anxiety and Inspiring Climate Action. This session will be recorded and it will also be streamed live on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who is joining today. Our featured speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Ellen Kelsey. Ellen Kelsey, PhD, is an award-winning author and thought leader for evidence-based hope and environmental solutions. Kelsey's work focuses on the study of the reciprocal relationship between humans and the rest of nature. Her newest book for adults, Hope Matters, Why Changing the Way We Think is Critical for Solving the Environmental Crisis, was published by Greystone Books in October 2020. Her influence can be seen in the hopeful solutions focus of her clients, including the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and other powerful institutions where she has served as a visiting fellow, including the Rachel Carson Center for the Environment and Society, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Stanford University and the Graduate School of Education. She co-created Hashtag Ocean Optimism, a Twitter campaign to crowdsource marine conservation solutions, which has reached more than 100 million shares since it launched in 2014. Passionate about bringing science-based stories of hope and multi-species resilience to the public, Kelsey is a popular keynote speaker and media commentator. She regularly serves as an author, artist, and resident, leading hopeful environmental workshops with kindergarten to university students across North America and around the world. She is a feature writer and podcast host for Hakai Magazine and a best-selling children's book author. Her newest book for children, Alas Goodbye, was published in April 2020. We're so excited to have Ellen speak with us today about tackling eco-anxiety, climate doomism, and hopeful solutions to climate change. A reminder that during her talk, please submit your questions to Ellen in the Q&A box on Zoom. I'll now invite Ellen to begin her presentation. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and, and thank you so much to uh, everyone for having me here. Um, it's, it's just a real pleasure to be part of an event that's celebrating and thinking about these important issues on a citywide basis and looking at it from the perspective of the arts and science coming together. That's really wonderful. Um, I'm going to just share my screen here. Here we are, and, and I too would like to begin with a recognition um, to the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory I am currently living and the Songhees, the Squamalt and Masonic peoples whose historic relations uh, with this land continue to this day. Um, you can probably see behind me, I'm, I'm in a house with a backyard behind. And during the time that we'll be speaking, um, you may in fact hear or see uh, three runner ducks who came to join us during the pandemic and often like to come and sort of hang around right behind me when I'm speaking. So uh, if that's what's going on, I hope that you enjoy their participation as well. Um, thank you as well for mentioning Hope Matters. Uh, much of what I'm talking about today is an idea that you'll see um, in this book. So I wanted to start just by asking you how you are feeling. And if you could just take a moment to settle into yourself and, and think about that question. It's an important question to ask 
because every day uh, we are really confronted by images and ideas about the state of the planet. So for example, here's a headline from Rolling Stone magazine from last October, where we see this incredible image of um, a pandemic sign burning in the California forest fires. And these kinds of images do raise very strong emotions for us, lots of feelings. And the reason that's so important to keep track of is that the number one way that we learn about the environment is actually through the media. Because we see so much of those kinds of problem identification um, ways of talking about the real issues that we face, it can lead some people to feel this. And this is a comment that was sent to me by a, a, a young student, um, a university student not so long ago. Now, increasingly academics all over the world are recognizing how important this whole aspect of how we feel and the emotions that we have um, are in terms of the ways in which we engage with issues like climate change and biodiversity loss and the other urgent issues that we face. So here is just a, a range of emotions that were collected and are being analyzed by uh, Panu Pekala, a researcher in Finland. And you might notice that you might share some of these feelings at this very moment, maybe, maybe more than one, maybe a number. I have asked all the students that I work with um, at universities, as well as younger students, how they feel when they think about the environment. And you can see over on the one side, descriptions that students share of the feelings they have. And I'm just contrasting that here in this slide with research done that looks at crisis reporters when they are in the midst of covering things like earthquakes and wars and school shootings, um, how they are feeling. And the reason I'm showing this is I just really want to underscore how strongly our feelings are around the environment and how much similarity there is between those and people who are in the midst of what feels like a very active um, and urgent problem. In fact, there's growing evidence if you look across the academic literature of new words being introduced to try to capture the feelings that children and adults have um, in terms of their hopelessness often about the state of the planet. So as I said, one of the reasons that we have these strong emotions, of course, are due to the real issues and they're reinforced by the fact that both our scientific journals and the media tends to focus very much on a problem identification. So we hear lots about the problems. In fact, research by um, at the University of Colorado in Boulder shows that newsmakers also deem problems more newsworthy than solutions. So again, across 117 media outlets in 55 countries, we see that we hear a lot more about problems and solutions. More than 90% of the news that we hear is in that problem identification when it comes to climate change and the environment. And we know now that we live in this 24 seven period of, of you know, media coming straight to our personal devices, that many of us in, are very engaged in what's called doom scrolling. In fact, we do so much doom scrolling right now that it was one of the words of the year for 2020. And that's just when we're looking at one bad news story after another over and over and over again. Now, of course, um, it's important that we know about these problems and we see these major headlines talking about um, just a Sunday very, very accurately represented this 12 year uh, time frame that was, came up from the Paris Accord. But we see again, very dramatic ways of representing that urgency. And it makes sense then that a lot of our media that we're taking in is focused on this idea of we've just got to get the word out. And that's based on the, the conception that if people just knew better, they would act better. But I think the really interesting part around this is what happens if, if we already do know better? And in fact, there's increasing amounts of evidence. This is just from January, um, so a few months ago, January 2021, that in fact, many people around the world know about climate change, are very concerned about climate change and want climate change action. So here we see a survey um, where two thirds of people looking across 50 countries, over a million people surveyed, um, saying that they really recognize the climate, um, climate change as a global emergency. So attitudes have really shifted. In fact, here we see from April 2020, American attitudes and, and 
desire to see climate change and demands for climate change or feeling that not enough is being done about climate change has really risen sharply. And the same is true in countries, many countries around the world. And that crosses socioeconomic levels. So the point I want to make is that our feelings are based on absolutely the reality of the problems that we face, the reality of the situation, and importantly, on our thoughts and beliefs and mindsets, and about the ways that we communicate how things are. What that means is that our subjective beliefs actually impact objective reality. So how we feel actually influences what ends up happening. And we see amazing examples of that, like this uh, report from January of this year. Of if we believe that the um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines are effective, then in fact, we have a higher immune response to them. So we know this from health research that our feelings and anticipation of what will happen can really influence what does happen. And that's led some um, researchers to ask, you know, is all this doom and gloom actually contributing to the public disengagement with climate change? You know, in our well-intentioned aims to talk about what's broken, have we left out what is, what is moving in a positive direction and in that way causing people to disengage? In fact, researchers like Maxwell Boykoff have found that when stories just focus on doom and gloom, they turn off those who are consuming them. People feel powerless and they don't feel like they can engage or have an entry point to do anything about the problem. So the point I'm trying to make with this is that when we have a fatalistic perspective and position hopelessness as a foregone conclusion, we, we actually create a, a debilitating mindset that causes us to shut down and tune out. So there's a collateral damage to this gloom and doom. In fact, hopelessness has been quite tightly tied to feelings of cynicism and apathy. And that's an important point to make because oftentimes people think that um, if we talk about hope, we will somehow create complacency. We'll make it so people think, oh, I don't have to do anything about anything. But in fact, the psychological literature shows a much stronger connection between hopelessness and apathy, feeling like there's nothing that can be done, than the opposite. In fact, Anthony Lizowitz at Yale University, or Tony as he goes by, um, talks about this hope gap between people's fears about climate change and their feelings of powerless to do, any, to do anything about it. Ellen Field, a researcher at Lakehead University, uh, did a major study uh, last year when it was published that showed that across Canada, students in grades seven to 12 had very high net awareness of climate change and that it was caused by people. But 46% of them felt that there was nothing that can be done to change it. So that's a real issue when we think about the importance of engaging with climate change and these other urgent and critical environmental issues. Um, we see the same thing on researchers looking at um, classrooms that persistently concentrate on problems without adequate attention to solutions who create this culture of doom and gloom. And here a university student shares kind of their personal experience of what that looks like. In the first half of every course, you're hit by how terrible everything is. And you look forward to the solutions that will be covered in the second half, but that second half never happens. So again, we have this perpetuation of a focus on the problems with very little attention on solutions. So you might just ask yourself these two questions as I'm continuing on and really think about, is this hope gap something you recognize in yourself or people you care about or, or spend a lot of time with? Um, and how might you help to bridge that hope gap? All of this to underscore the idea that hope and emotions really matter. Um, just this last summer, I've been working with an international collection of academics who have been putting together an existential toolkit for climate justice educators. And what that is, is a whole series of resources um, to help people look at the feelings that they have around climate, the climate crisis, and ways that we might come to share those feelings in ways that help us to be more productive with our feelings, to express them. Um, in this case, uh, this is one of the resources in there, a podcast series about facing our feelings of loss and grief um, around what's happening to the planet. And it's really important when I talk about hope, sometimes I think people think that I mean that we, we should always be happy or looking on the bright side. No, what's really important is to give voice to all of our emotions, um, what Lisa Kretz called outlaw emotions of environmental grief and anger and despair. 
um, as well as our feel, excuse me, our feelings of hope. And the reason for that is that many emotions that we have, like helplessness or despondency, cause us to really feel powerless. They take away our agency or our sense that we can impact something. Whereas hope and anger are actually both very activating emotions. When we feel those things, we tend to feel really like we want to do something about the situation. So my work is all based on evidence-based hope. Um, as I said, it's not this Pollyannish idea of looking on the bright side. I think that's really wishful thinking. And what I'm talking about is more rooted in these kinds of fields, like justified hope, which comes from the areas of philosophy, or looking in oncology at how, how we think about hope in end-of-life moments or in times of critical illness, wise hope. So all kinds of um, researchers have been looking at this question of hope. And what I think is important to our climate change engagement is this idea of evidence-based hope being facing the realities of the situation, absolutely grounded in science, understanding the problems, and then holding out that we really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we have forecasts and models, which are super important for us to help us see what could happen and what's likely to happen if we stay on the trajectory we're on, but really holding open the idea that we live in constant change and that as we make change, we impact what happens next. In fact, that our world of data, which is based at Oxford University, has this really interesting finding that when we have a really good knowledge about how the world has changed, we're more optimistic about the changes that we can make. And as Sunday said, feeling pride is actually a very strong motivator for environmental uh, decisions and engagement. Over time, we've tended to focus really on fear and shame as the way that we motivate people to act. But when you look across the psychological literature, it's actually things like compassion and empathy and relationships and meaningful purpose and pride, which are the things that help us to stay engaged with these really difficult issues um, as they're happening and for the longer term. So shifting away from fear and shame and into these sorts of collective action, uh, collective sense of community is really important. And another really important part of engagement is really being up to date on information. So time stamped information. And you'll notice as I'm talking um, that, that all of the things I'll be sharing have a time stamp on them so that you can see change that is happening um, in, in real time. So where do we look for the kinds of stories that show us the kinds of things people are doing that are moving in the right direction? So it turns out there's been this real emergence in the last decade of, of a field called solutions journalism. Some people call it constructive journalism. And in solutions journalism, what you're doing is focusing absolutely rigorous reporting on the problem. And you're focusing rigorous reporting on the kinds of solutions people are engaged in, how well they work, how they might be applied to other settings. And there's now a solutions story tracker, which you can find on the solutions Journalism, journalism network, which allows you to source um, media, which is coming from 176 countries on issues that are important to you. So what kinds of solutions are people engaged in? So I was just looking the other day on, on the movement of divestment at universities, for example, um, moving away from fossil fuels to renewables. And uh, so there, as I was searching through that, I was able to find this particular, um, these particular stories. And you can see down to the left on your screen, you can search by topic as well as by all kinds of other filters to help you pinpoint the kinds of solutions you're interested in learning more about. We also know that the solutions movement has been really, really quite tightly tied to covering um, issues from a social justice and equity perspective. And this brand new guide just came out uh, earlier this month for journalists in terms of covering from a solutions orientation in an equitable way. Another wonderful solution source is Project Drawdown. And Project Drawdown uh, amalgamates big data information from around the world to look at what are the most effective ways that we collectively can make a difference for climate change. Um, and then you're able to move through there in terms of uh, particular issues that you might be involved in. And it's a great source of quantifiable or numbers-based information. And you'll see if you go into Project Drawdown that uh, dealing with things like food waste 
and switching to plant-based diets, or more plant-based uh, eating in your diet are very powerful ways. I think food waste is something like number four as a collective way in which we can positively engage with climate change and have a big impact. Um, if you like podcasts, this is one of my favorites, BBC um, World Service does this podcast called People Fixing the World, which looks at all kinds of issues that people are engaged with. And in this case here, we had a, um, a program on putting a price on carbon as one of the ways of, of dealing with climate change. And you can always just do, you know, your regular old Google search or Yahoo search or whatever you use. Um, but making sure to add keywords like the issue and solutions or the issue and things moving in a good direction or things moving in, in the ways we need them to go. And when you add those additional keywords, you'll get different kinds of searches, which will help you to see uh, media that is reporting on solutions as well. So for example, when I did this uh, just last week, came up with a uh, grist, which is a source I really like. They do a weekly newsletter called The Beacon. Uh, grist is a Canadian publication. And they were reporting on the city of Petaluma in California, which is not so far away from San Francisco, um, having just uh, passed a citywide ban on gas stations. So they currently have 16 gas stations. They've banned the addition of any more. And even for those that do exist, uh, no more gas pumps going in, but only electric charging stations. So the kinds of shifts that are going on in the world. Here's just a few of my favorite sources for timestamp solutions oriented content. Um, there are many out there for you to look for. All of this is important because when we talk about the environment, we often uh, do it in a way that reinforces this idea of the starting line. We say things like, if we do this, then this might happen in the future. And when you do that, it makes you feel like the whole race is ahead, like all the hard work is ahead of us. So I really work hard on saying things like, because people have been doing this, we are now in this situation. So really shifting our language away from the starting line to recognize important things that are already happening. So for example, just yesterday, um, we saw, and an, an, again in the grist in this case, um, you know, large money, big dollars going in the United States towards dealing with air pollution and other environmental health risks in low income communities. And the reason that really uh, cued my interest is that that's an important initiative. And it's built on top of an, of an initiative around the Clean Air Act that has been going on for several decades. And we see here, um, coming out of the uh, Cornell University, um, a report that shows that because of uh, you know, the Clean Air Act being in place for several decades, we've actually prevented the loss of about 1.5 billion birds over the past four decades. So again, recognizing we have lots of important and hard work ahead of us, but we also have important work that has been done and is reaping results, and we just need to keep amplifying those. I think a beautiful example of this is the climate change marches that many of you will have been involved in, um, in 2019. And one massive result of those is that now, as of December 2020, one in 10 people on the planet now lives in a place that has declared a climate emergency. We know that that's a major driver for the city of London and City of London, this is part of their process of, the, of putting together their climate emergency action plan, which will be unfolding over, over the next few years. Now, the reason I think these climate emergency action plans are so powerful is that they, they, we know from research that cities are really, really integral to the climate change movement, um, that they were very fast to take up climate change and are really important motivators because when we see action being taken at a, at a community and local level that we are part of, it really increases our sense of agency and hope. So it takes this global issue of concern and places it at, at the level in which we live collectively together. So communities and cities especially are really important in terms of hope and in terms of action. We also see national responses to the climate change marches in terms of um, focuses on, on uh, sorry, climate action. We see movements uh, in terms of budget money. This was just um, announced February 10th. We see coming into now uh, discussions in law around whether we take a legal framework 
around our commitments to net zero carbon emissions. This was a discussion going on in Canadian Lawyer Magazine. And we saw, of course, when uh, President Biden came into office on the first day of office, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. And again, the reason I think that's such a hopeful movement is not only that it's very important that the United States be a player and a, a signatory to that agreement, but also it shows how climate change has really shifted from being a polarizing issue in the United States to being an issue of commonality in the United States. Um, and we see the president who's dealing with a polarized country choosing that as, an, as a major act, and we see that it, it absolutely is now seen as a unifying idea. We also see things like this. So in October of 2020, Next Era Energy, which is the world's largest provider of wind and solar energy, becoming more valuable than the oil giant ExxonMobil. I just wanted to point out here in September 2019, we saw 77 countries and more than 100 cities committing to net zero um, carbon emissions by 2050. So that was in September 2019. Then we see here in December 2020, essentially a year later, that that number has increased to 110 countries. So again, keeping track of timing really helps us to see the kinds of shifts that are moving in the directions we need so we can amplify them farther. And I just wanted to point out too that as we change our behavior, we also are in the midst of scientists learning new things that are important to us. So for a long time, the, the sense was that even if we stop our activities, it will be several decades perhaps before we see the kinds of changes um, that we need to be seeing in terms of of emissions responses. But in recent years, really over the last seven years or so, the scientific consensus has shown that actually things will, um, will, will see a positive impact much more quickly than they had previously imagined. And so even our understanding of how, what that time frame is, is changing as, as science continues to grow. So for all of these reasons, it's really essential to keep up to date content in, in terms of engaging with climate justice. One of the ways of doing that is to kind of choose trends that are moving in directions that you care about and that, that are moving in ways that are important in terms of dealing with climate change and other environmental issues. So for example, single use plastic is something that many people are very concerned about. And it's helpful to know, here's from October, 2020, that 170 nations have pledged to significantly reduce their use of single-use plastic by 2030. And you can just look across here and see the many different ways that that is being done through bans or taxes or levies, um, all kinds of ways, restrictions. We also recognize that our deep concern about the state of plastic in the ocean, for example, is driving now calls for a large UN treaty to deal with plastic pollution in the ocean. So again, we need that treaty because it is a, a vital issue of concern and that you know, the call for the treaty shows how much awareness there is around that issue. Um, as, as was kindly mentioned in my introduction, I happened to co-create this Twitter tag, hashtag ocean optimism in 2014. And our idea was at that point, it was really hard to find these kinds of examples of ocean successes and solutions. And so we wanted to crowdsource those. And I'm happy to say that that's now a very vibrant Twitter tag and has, has gone on to inspire the Smithsonian Institution now has, for example, a major program of earth optimism, which you can attend international summits on or follow their Twitter tag and other social media tags. And the University of Oxford now has a hashtag conservation optimism movement. And these kinds of tags allow us to crowdsource, as I said, examples of what's changing. So when we think about single use plastic in the beaches, for example, we see back here in January that the Scottish government is increasing their charge on single use plastic bags, um, in part because they've seen a drop in the amount of plastic on the beaches. And so the question is, if that tariff goes up higher, um, will that have even more positive impact on marine litter. So it allows us to see these changes. Another reason it, it's really important to think about whether you're consuming only solutions, or sorry, only media that is focused in problem identification or that which also includes solutions is that emotions are contagious. They're contagious face-to-face, -face, they're contagious via Zoom, and they're contagious online. So when we're doom scrolling, we're actually 
feeding our feelings of helplessness. And when we're sharing those stories, we're contributing to, to really feelings of it's all too large for us. And when we do the opposite, we can actually have a, a, a positive impact in terms of, of sharing and essentially spreading by contagion more hopeful um, engagement. So hope really lies in this capacity of stories to transform. And I think a really critical element of this that we often don't think about is that we are one of 8.7 million species on Earth. So what we do really matters. And also all of these other species are also constantly in action um, in engagement with ecosystems. So as mentioned, I, I wrote this children's book, which was published this year, which really looks at the way that other species, for example, um, deal with grief um, and support one another, uh, highly intelligent social animals like chimpanzees and gorillas and killer whales and elephants um, at end of life. So again, all based on first person interviews with scientists, but presented in sort of a poetic way to engage us with these ideas. So in Wild Ideas, this page which says, a dozen humpback whales blow a fine net of bubbles to trap tasty fish, pop, 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 gulp. That idea is, is coming from the fact that humpback whales are actually incredible social networkers. They work collectively, 10 to 14 whales coming together, unrelated whales, but the same whales who come together each year to do this bubble netting in which they blow a ring of bubbles collectively. And then those bubbles trap large schools of fish and the whales come flying up underneath and grab those fish. Um, so this capacity to work collectively, use uh, tools in that way uh, has actually helped to, we see the increase, for example, of humpback whales and gray whales uh, in many parts of the world. So here along the coast of British Columbia, we're seeing these increases. So the agency of those whales themselves. We know that humpback whales are making a comeback. Um, all the populations except for two have been making a significant comeback after the end of commercial whaling. And these rebounding whale populations are really good from an ocean ecosystem standpoint. It improves the health of the ocean. It helps to improve um, fisheries in the sense of a healthier ocean. And interestingly enough, um, in 2019 here, we see economists looking at how the impact of whales moving all this water actually brings tiny plants called phytoplankton up to the surface. And those phytoplankton and other um, marine plants turn out to capture 40% of, of carbon on Earth. So it's a really important, um, sorry, they're, they're responsible for 40% of the creation of, of the oxygen that we breathe through carbon capture. So carbon capture is tied to more whales. And it's exciting to see movements by many countries towards marine protected areas. We see this here, 75 countries, sorry, this was just from a week ago, um, committing to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030, 25% by 2020. And that's part of this bigger movement, which sees um, countries in many parts of the world, including Canada, making those commitments of 25% on land and ocean, 30% um, by 2030. And we can track, here's something from New Scientist, looking at, in fact, the percentage of key biodiversity areas protected on, and is on the rise. And that's an important thing to keep track of and push for. We know that that will include not only protection, but the necessity of ecological restoration. And we see very important examples of this in Washington state, for example, after the largest dam removal occurred in 2014, the return of salmon and other species very swiftly into the area. And it's important to keep track of where these ecological restoration projects take us. I think a very important part of all of this here in Canada, for example, um, the national parks that we've seen in the last uh, decade have been led or co-led by First Nations. It changes in an important way the way we think about our relationships to land and protected areas and studies like these that show that Indigenous managed lands tied to high biodiversity rates. In your stardust, I was really trying to reinforce the idea that we are also part of nature. 
you know, so through interviews with pollenologists, people who study how pollen moves, um, we find this, your breath is alive with the promise of flowers. Each time you blow a kiss to the world, you spread pollen that might grow to be a plant. So it's not just butterflies and bats that are pollinators, we are too. And you are never alone. This page talks about branches stretching across streets, creating peaceful neighborhoods. Mother trees entwine their roots, raising vast shady forests that keep you and the planet cool. That's reflecting research like this, uh, many, much of it done by Suzanne Samard at UBC, a forester there, who has shown that trees are connected through their fungal and root networks, and they actually actively share resources back and forth between each other, creating more resilient forests. Uh, cities have been keeping track of urban forests and their importance. And so we see here the city of Vancouver. Here we can see the satellite map that shows us which areas of the city have the most trees. And the reason that's important is also there are social justice aspects to it. We know that streets that have more treats, for example, have lower rates of crime. There's other research that shows the health benefits of living on areas where there are more trees. And of course, there's been growing recognition of how our access to nature is really an important part of our mental and emotional well being. So I'll just move through these. So hope lies in this capacity of stories to transform. And the last thing I really wanted to touch on with you is that when COVID 19 hit, it created what is known in media circles as a media eclipse which means that you almost hear nothing about other stories and, and really just mostly we've been hearing about the pandemic. Of course, that makes sense and that's important, but it's caused a lot of people to think that people must no longer care about climate change because we don't hear much about it in the news. In fact, there are increasing numbers of research um, evidence to show us that, in, that climate change concern stayed steady or in many cases increased. Um, during the time that we've been dealing with the pandemic. And one of the places we can see that impact is in the financial pages. Responding to, to our demands, um, that concern I was talking about earlier on with people really concerned about climate change on a global level. And we see interesting things like this with these companies that are mentioned below have made commitments to meet the Paris Accords, but 10 years sooner. You see Jeff Bezos of Amazon, for example, pledging $10 billion towards climate action um, groups. And what's important in this is that that money is transparent. You can follow the groups that it goes to and the actions that they're engaged with. We wanted to touch on this as part of all of this. 42% of the world's population is 25 years of age or younger. And the top values that come up in that age group across most of the world are social justice and climate change. Those are really critical issues for people in that age category. Um, when we look at research that was done here in September, 2020, looking at millennials and Gen Zs before and after the start of COVID-19, we see that they remain very strongly focused on large societal issues, wanting people ahead of profits and prioritizing environmental sustainability. And when we look at the youth justice, youth climate justice movement, what we see to me is this exciting movement where those emotions are more broadly felt. So really mixing joy with loss and hope with grief and bringing together just as this wonderful gathering has today, arts and science, and lots of ways in which we think about allyship and mental health and care for one another and justice as being critical elements of the climate justice um, actions that we take. We also see the rise of other forms of arts engagement and climate uh, change. The, many of you will be following the Sunrise Movement that brings song to bear in their protests. And of course, song has been an important part of emancipation, emancipation movements for a long, long time, but we see it done to really positive effect in the climate revolution through the sunrise movement. So these top values of social justice and climate change are really essential for us to keep track of. This youth climate justice activism is not really focused on sustainability, it's focused on transformation. So really demanding those kind of equitable changes as we tackle 
the climate crisis that we face. So again, really accepting what is, is essential, but it's really important not to, not to mix that up with fatalism. In fact, Michael Mann, one of the leading climate change scientists talks about climate doomism as the new climate denial. So when we could deny climate change, then of course we wouldn't have to act. But if we think it's already doomed, we also don't have to act because it's a foregone conclusion. In the spirit of um, this movement that recognizes art and science together as essential tools of climate engagement, I just wanted to share this poem. Wolves make rivers, salmon grow forests, seabirds fertilize coral reefs. Every last one of us is made from new stars and old stars. We are always becoming. So hope to me is not a complacent act. It's, it's not complacent, it's a powerful political act. It's a choice we make in terms of recognizing evidence-based solutions and actively spreading those in ways to amplify their effectiveness. I really feel it's important to be a hope activist. And um, I'm gonna stop my screen there and see if you have any questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Ellen. You're most um, welcome. I, I do apologize. There's some uh, trucks and construction happening just outside my house, uh, which is perfect timing. Um, but we're going to keep going ahead with the Q&A um, period. So we did get a couple questions. Um, first one from Meredith asks, in regard to single use plastic charges, are retailers made to contribute a portion of the charge to a governing body of those environmental groups? that are making things happen in the arena of environmental climate change. That's such a good idea. And um, what I would say is when you look across those 170 countries and, and they're really interesting cases of whole large regions, uh, in Africa, for example, many countries working together as a region, the European Union working together as a massive region around this, there are so many different ways that people are engaging in those kinds of like, what's the most effective thing? What works best in our context? And so I'd really encourage her, it's such a good question to look, where is that happening? And, and, if, and if and where, uh, in what ways has that been effective? And could that be applied to, to where she's based? Wonderful, thanks. Um, we also got a question uh, about, um, it says you talked about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has impacted our information. What was that term called, uh, the term you used to describe? Yeah, it's called a media eclipse. And it makes sense, right? It blacks out um, everything else. And, and it's really just, a, in my sense, it's, it's also a very good example of the world coming together around an issue, you know? So we, we see that eclipse because of it being a priority issue. Wonderful, thanks for answering that one. Um, we have a few more and I just encourage anyone else who's who's watching to continue to type in your questions um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Oh, I'd um, also like to say, I'm very happy for people to make comments or suggestions mm -hmm. as well, or if they have other information to share, that's, that would be most welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, for sure. We, um, the chat should be active for attendees. I've seen a couple people say, hey, at the beginning. So um, yeah, feel free to share uh, comments and links and stuff in the chat as well. Awesome. Um, so one question we had is, what are some of the climate solutions that you know of that youth are coming up with? Um, for example, like new technologies or social media trends, stuff like that. Um, what are some examples of those solutions that are giving you hope right now? Oh, lots of things give me hope right now. I think one of the things that people are doing in their everyday life that is really powerful and, and important is, is really thinking about what they're eating. You know, so this shift towards more plant-based eating, and, and there are so many terms now, flexitarians, veganisms, you know, there's lots of ways one could do that. Um, but that really does have a very positive impact from a climate change perspective, also has a big impact in terms of um, 
uh, you know, UN bodies, uh, scientists have looked at what's the healthiest way to feed the world and deal with issues of poverty, for example, and hunger. And that is an important shift in that as well. And so to watch that rise and, and the more that uh, youth especially have been driving this plant-based food movement, we see it being so much more accessible. And there's research done by Stanford University in their mind and body lab that has shown, um, it's, it's really interesting when we think about our mindsets that we may know that that's a healthier choice, but we may rebel against it. But when we see it as delicious and yummy and it's sort of satisfying those kind of food cravings for us, um, we're much more likely to eat it. And so it's been interesting as plant-based eating has been on the rise really all over uh, countries in many parts of the world now taking that on, uh, we see many more yummy options and then more people choosing that option as well. That's awesome. And we also have some great plant-based restaurants in London too. Oh, wonderful. So yeah, people should, um, maybe if I get a chance, I'll type some in the chat and people can, can check them out. Yeah. Um, I think also, I might just add that, um, I think there's a real interest, uh, and, and lived reality of sort of this gift economy amongst, uh, people of many ages. We saw it being shared during COVID-19 more obviously, but that has been a really important part of dealing with food waste uh, and, and really recognizing waste and, and what is enough and our consumption patterns. We really see that being an open question and open action on the part of youth and, and of course other people of other ages, but that's really been an important part of really thinking about a gift economy and, and a compassionate sharing. Awesome. Yeah, we have some local buy nothing groups like by neighborhood uh, here in London. And the one that I'm in is always active. And yeah, there's just so much uh, great stuff that's being shared. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of nice like neighborhood um, appreciation. So. We also see a real movement away from getting driver's licenses amongst mm -hmm. younger people and, and demanding other forms of transportation a vast rise in bicycle ridership, which was already happening before the pandemic and really uh, took off during the pandemic. Um, we see calls for uh, more pedestrian friendly areas of cities and cities that were already working on closing off areas uh, so that there's more multimodal ways of getting around bikes and walking and all those other kinds of things. Um, that trend was already in place in many cities of the world and has escalated um, during COVID-19. Awesome. Um, oh, sorry, my screen went kind of weird for a sec. Um, but we did have a comment from Pat um, that the ducks in your backyard provide a very pacifying mood to your presentation. I'm glad. And, <laughs> I would That's agree. Enjoy that. them, Pat. I think I just saw Richard, um, who laid an egg this morning, uh, just wander by behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we did get a question from Steph that asks, are electric cars really better? with the pollution that's involved in making the batteries and shipping them and disposing them, um, are electric cars better for the environment? Yeah, and of course that's a very active area, but um, as we see the movement away from fossil fuels, that's a very important transition. When we look at project drawdown and the impacts of that fossil fuels, we really need to be dealing with that. And as electric cars have been in increasingly in use, um, we see lots of major announcements going on now by car companies around electric cars, then those other environmental issues are being tackled and must be tackled and questioned. And so again, a really good example where when we're in a solutions orientation, we're not saying this is the answer and it's fixed forever. We're saying these are directions we need to be moving in and continuously, rigorously looking at and improving. Um, but not being afraid to move in a direction for fear it's not 100% perfect, but instead moving in that direction because we know the alternative is not right and we want to be going in these directions. Yeah, so thank you for that good question. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Great answer too. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question about where is the line between being hopeful and thinking that things will work out or technical solutions will magically arrive? Um, Where's that line? I'm worried that hope might not always translate into action. Yeah, such a good question. Um, yeah, I think it's, there are many things going on there. One is the sphere, again, that if we're somehow saying that there's 
some hopefulness uh, that we are in some ways discounting the severity of the issue, you know, that we're causing people to be complacent. But as I said earlier, that the psychological literature really shows the opposite. When we can see that we're part of a collective and it's actually having an impact, we stay engaged. We're much more likely to throw ourselves behind it and keep doing the hard work. And when we, we just hear the problems and we don't see any action and we don't know about it, we tend to give up. We feel helpless and powerless. So that's part of it. Um, the other thing is I think there's really interesting things uh, within cultural narratives. So we've had for a long time this sort of cultural narrative of the noble bright, which is you know some great, great like we see it in fairy tales, right? Some wonderful hero will come in and rescue us, right? That, that, that sort of noble bright narrative. And of course there's the dominant grim dark narrative that we see in this doom and gloom um, way that we think about these issues. But what's emerged in recent time is this hope punk narrative that I think is really important. And in hope punk, it puts a lot of agency or power within ourselves. And it says, I am going to act in the ways that I know to be important to this issue that I care about, you know, so I'm going to really do it myself. And I'm going to continue to do it collectively with others. And even if it didn't work, <laughs> I would still do it because it's committing to the values that I believe in. And so I would say that the climate change marches have really been evidence of hope punk of this collective action of, of demanding justice around climate change as a social justice issue is, is to my mind an example of hope punk. And that's where I think we see our empowered selves coming together through collective action. And I think of hope as a very collective um, mindset. Wonderful. Um, we have a question that asks, when you're feeling overwhelmed, is it better to think more about local activities or concentrate on the global issues? Oh, so good. Let's say when you're feeling overwhelmed, it's really important to take care of yourself. You know, so there's a lot of work now that shows that self-kindness and self-care is a critical part of how we stay engaged with issues that matter and that we bring our actual selves to bear. You know, so if you're a poet or you're a, a person who does needlework or you're someone who makes jam or, you know, whatever things you do uh, for yourself that you enjoy, uh, to do them is really important. It's an important way that we contribute to something. And then we see that in, in the uh, climate marches, for example, people supporting in ways other than marching, um, that allyship idea. Um, but I, I would say that what we do know from psychological literature is that when we work on a local basis around things and we can see the impacts, that's very motivating. It's very empowering. And so often acting in that local way around issues of global importance, it can, be, can really help our intrinsic motivation, the things that make us just stay with it. Um, so, and I do know that there's research that shows millennials, for example, are much more likely to engage in issues in their own areas that are important to them and then switch to another issue that's important and switch to another issue that's important um, rather than staying in one group, for example. So really situating action around things that matter and seeing the results of it. Awesome. And then, so along those lines, um, talking about local action, um, from your perspective, what are um, some things that you would recommend, some action items that you'd recommend the City of London to do? Um, to pursue for local climate action? Well, I'm really excited that the city is thinking about its climate emergency action plan from a solutions orientation, you know, in this way that we're having this conversation. Um, because we know that the ways in which we engage people, that, that that means, you know, making more transparent the movements that are happening and, and what actions are being done um, so that people can be aware of those and part of them. And also really being... Um, consultative. I'm excited today that I'm here, uh, you know, with your youth uh, action people, because we need to hear voices of, of all of us within a city. And when we hear those voices, we're much clearer what the priorities are and, and where and how we collectively act. And, and that listening and hearing each other uh, is, is super important because climate change is a global issue that requires a vast diversity of actions. And I think that when we're in that way, we can look to other cities and ourselves to what has been effective, you know, the, 
um, capacity towards urbanization, towards uh, renewables, all of these kinds of things, really thinking about, I know there's a lot of attention right now around our buildings within cities um, and, and the kinds of um, energy footprints that they have and how important it is to address those, things like urban forests, all of these sorts of initiatives that I know are within your action plan, but really hearing where they're important and then the energies that we put into them so that we reach underserved communities um, as well as all of the communities in our in our cities. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah. Um, towards the end, I will be sharing a couple links in the chat about how people can get involved with the city's climate emergency action plan. So there's a spot where you can, you know, read more about the plan and share your feedback. And then there's also a climate action simulator tool. Uh, we, we shared about it in a previous event. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat um, afterwards as well. Can I add one thing to that too, Leah? I yeah. think a lot of times people, there's been this sort of politicized thing that if we think about local and individual collective action, that we're somehow taking the pressure off of large um, corporations. Uh, to my mind, both are really important. You know, that, that it doesn't undermine our local and collective actions. Those are essential. And there's lots of research to show how powerful and effective those are in terms of making change and at the same time holding corporations, you know, accountable for their actions as well. So to my mind, both of these and more are really essential to, to the kinds of engagement we need and are having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also saw someone in the chat said that grassroots action is, is so important, but it's even more important that the people we elect um, who make these decisions are, you know, making these decisions um, that are good for the earth. Um, and totally, like, it's it's not like one or the other, like you're saying, it's, it's both. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really good point that you raised as well. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, as individuals, how can we make small changes in our habits for improving how we live environmentally? You know, one of the most powerful things is uh, when people you care about do something, you're much more likely to do it, you know? So um, I, for example, hang my laundry to dry, not only because I know it's important, but because I really admire my neighbor and my neighbor always does it. And so I would just be sort of... Uh, feel too awkward if I didn't do it. So it can really help to situate yourselves around, you know, to see those kind of actions. And we know, for example, people are much more likely to, if, they, if they're able to put in solar panels on their homes when their neighbors do that. So we have a lot of influence. It comes again through this contagiousness and, and the fact that we're really social beings. And so when we um, situate ourselves and, and, you know, help to drive that, we also are reinforced ourselves by those actions. There's research that shows, for example, in hotel rooms, if there's something that shows you how much water you conserved in the shower you just had, you're much more likely to conserve water in that shower, um, even if you don't get a cut in the hotel rate or any other thing, that, that just that feedback is really helpful. So I think there are all these social cues that really help us. And I, I think that's important because often we hold ourselves accountable and that's really not how we act. We are much more likely to act when we see that it's a positive thing that we do with, around people that we care about. Mm -hmm. Totally, I agree, great answer. <laughs> um, we have a question, um, essentially asking for a copy of your slides. I have a feeling what that answer might be, but if you wanna answer, Ellen. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, really all of these ideas are in, are in my book, Hope Matters, and I, I really encourage you to look at it. And as the librarian kindly said, I just did the first time I've ever done an audio book, so uh, you can listen to me more if you wish. <laughs> so it exists as an audio book or a print book. And of course, I know, Leah, you've been recording this for the, um, for the Facebook page and, and the city's page, so it's available in that way, too. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, we will um, share some of these links in a follow up email, not all of the ones that Ellen has mentioned in her talk. But yeah, it will be recorded. So um, hopefully, you know, you can jot down any references that kind of jump out at you that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question that reads, it's exciting to see shifts in investments and more options available via mutual funds and stocks. Do you see or have you heard of any ways to move investment into smaller companies, but still in an organized way? Mm, that's great. I, I myself am not um, 
aware enough to give a good answer on that particular issue. But I, but I do know that we have a lot of power in our demands of things. You know, we we see, for example, IKEA, the largest um, uh, furniture sales company in the world, is now looking at um, uh, gently used items of IKEA going back into their cycle. You know that they have large uh, sustainability commitments, and and including that, and that is a result of demand from consumers. So in that way, we are consumers in the way that we invest. So I, I would just really encourage that. And I would use solutions journalism and other sources to see, you know, is that happening somewhere? In what ways is it happening? Um, and how could I amplify that? Wonderful. Um, we have a question that says, Ellen, I've been reveling in joy and delight um, in a really important element of fostering my own sense of hope. So do you have any questions on how to translate these qualities into climate action? Yes, so I think it's when you see something that is moving in a positive and impactful direction, you know, and again, you can look in Project Drawdown and see what are the top priorities, how do we help move those, um, and then share it. You know, share it on all your social media feeds, share it with the person you see on the street, you know, just really make a point of sharing evidence-based um, content because then you're in fact it, um, helping others feel joyful and and I really think it's a critical climate action to do that because we know that we disengage when we think it's hopeless and you'll it, once you start noticing this I know um, sometimes I'll ask my students to to do a 12 day journal where they spend half an hour every day outside and half an hour every day consuming solutions based journalism that's evidence based um, and they really notice a change in the way that they feel um, and start to really notice how problem identified um, most of the uh, journalism they're taking in is. So it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mindfulness in a way of noticing what are you taking in on a regular basis and how does that in, influence your feelings? So doing it for yourself and then thinking about how you share that with others. When the conversation tips towards the negative, you can hear it. And you should hear it and listen because it shows people really care, but then also add, um, you know, oh, I noticed this is moving in this way and, and that's why I'm doing this. This is why I'm committing to this or this is why I do this action. Mm, awesome. Um, and kind of along those lines, like something that um, a question I had actually um, during your presentation was, so you talk a lot about like emotions and how, um, emotions like hope and anger, like fueling action. So I'm just wondering um, how an understanding of ourselves and like how we're doing can connect to a better understanding of the planet and a better understanding of other living things. Yeah, as the mindfulness movement, which is just one of one way of understanding ourselves has really grown um, in many parts of the world. There's more and more research that shows connections between mindfulness and uh, pro-environmental behavior, for example. So uh, I think we've, we've often thought in terms of because we're in this urgent issue and we have a sense of, you know, we must act very quickly, which is true collectively. We are on a very important timeline, but that can sometimes translate into a ceaseless, you know, sh you know barrage on ourselves. Of, of, of kind of negative self-talk about our, our poor behavior, you know, that sort of thing. And when we do that, um, it really does cause us to burn out. And, and we don't want to be burned out. We want to be actively engaged. And so, yes, that knowing ourselves and hearing ourselves and taking care of ourselves. And, and what I find, too, is when you know others are acting on an issue, when I know there's 170 countries working towards single-use plastic issues, then it really helps me to pause and breathe and know that I'm part of a collective movement and that I can have this moment to be outside with these ducks, you know, um, and to take a breath and then engage again. So it's not that this is this relentless tirade of, of uh, shaming oneself, which I think it happens for lots of people around these issues that they care deeply about. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. Thanks for answering um, my question. Um, I have one more. Um, so, Shortly, we're going, going to be hearing from a local youth counselor uh, from Young London. And so this question is just um, asking you about um, in your work, if you found a connection between 
I guess, like the level of hope, like the amount of hope and someone's age. So like, I'm wondering if, if youth have more hope or less hope than older generations when it comes to addressing climate change? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, what I would say is that um, it's really, really clear that climate change and social justice are very important priorities and youth have grown up in this gloom and doom narrative. And so, and they're very aware of this urgent timeline. And so there's, there's a real issue of equal anxiety and feelings of despair and um, hopelessness amongst even youth that are very, you know, um, care very deeply about these issues. And sometimes we see despondency, right? And I think the problem is when people feel despondent, a lot of times we, we read that as, as if they simply don't know there's a problem. And then we layer on even more um, doom and gloom to try and sort of encourage them into action. And so I, I would say that I, I'm really concerned. And in fact, the American Psychological Association, the Canadian Psychological Association, the Australian Psychological Association, a number of them all recognize this issue of eco anxiety around children and youth. And so I think it's really behooves us to be uh, really paying careful attention to community and self care and really thinking about um, the kinds of culture we're creating around engagement and, and thinking about it, not only in terms of its positive impact on climate change, but in terms of mental and emotional well-being. It's really essential to focus on time-stamped, current evidence-based solutions. Wonderful. Um, that was my last question. Do you have any other quick comments at this no, point? No, I'm just, I'm really pleased and uh, appreciative of this opportunity to speak with all of you. And I'll be watching, you know, what happens within your city and, and cities around the world. Cities are powerful agents and important agents for uh, dealing with the climate crisis. And so I, and I'm very pleased to see the, the, the youth focus of the city. Um, we know the city of Manchester, for example, has a very active youth program. So does the city of Boulder, Colorado. There are a number of examples and um, it's, it's just really critical and important and I'm really pleased to see it. And I also really appreciate being here with spoken word poets and you know, it, that's really inspiring to me. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so I'm going to pass it off now to Singwon to introduce our second speaker. Um, so when you're ready, Singwon. So now I will introduce our second speaker, Rimsha Ashraf from Young London. Young London is a local organization that aims to promote equity and community spaces by facilitating opportunities for young people to co-create solutions and bring perspectives for meaningful impact in London and the region. One of their core programs is the London Youth Advisory Council made up of 15 youth counselors and supported by a team of staff and volunteers. So Rimsha is a grade 12 student at London Central SS through the London Youth Advisory Council, LYAC, and she hopes to learn and take away a lot of important lessons. The LYAC focuses on community issues that matter to the young people in the city and works on eliminating these issues. Some of the issues that Rimsha is passionate about are anti-racism, mental health, climate change, and environmental issues. In her free time, she enjoys reading and writing and playing volleyball. Rimsha plans to pursue either business or law at either Western or the University of Toronto starting next year. And uh, just a reminder that during her talk, please submit your questions to Rimsha in the Q&A box on Zoom. I'll now invite Rimsha to begin her presentation. Hi, everyone. So we can just move on to the next slide. I'm Rimsha, and I'm a counselor on the London Youth Advisory Council, which is also known as the LYC for this year's term. I would love to I want to thank London Environmental Network for having me here and wanting to hear what I have to say. So a little bit about me. I'm a grade 12 at, student at London Central. This school year, apart from actual school and extracurriculars, was spent applying to universities for me. Ever since I was a kid, I've wanted to go into business, so I have now narrowed my options down to my top two choices. I want to either attend Western or the University of Toronto next year to study business. Fingers crossed I get in. So some things I absolutely enjoy and love to do in my spare time are reading, playing volleyball and painting and reading the news. I didn't even know I could paint until recently. 
in quarantine, I was very bored and now I've found something I'm actually good at. Also, as I mentioned before, I'm on the LYC and through being a counselor, I teamed up with some of the other counselors and started an initiative called Everyday Empowerment, which I'll be talking about more in a couple minutes. The things I'll be talking about today are one, what Young London is and what my role as a youth counselor is, two, how I became interested in environmental issues, and three, some things that youth could be doing to help the environment and to have a positive impact on the city. So we can go on to the next slide. So starting with what Young London even is. Young London's mission is to promote equity in community spaces by facilitating opportunities for young people to co-create solutions and bring perspectives for meaningful impact in London and the region. In simpler words, Young London is a platform for young people in the city of London to get involved and have their voices heard. Young London runs a variety of programs that offer many opportunities for young people to get involved. Some of these programs include the LYC, which is what I'm on, Canada Life Young Leaders, Youth and Philanthropy, Community Action Team, and Generations of Leaders. If you're interested in finding out more about these pro programs, I have linked their website on the slide and you can read more about them there. To find information on the specific programs, at the top of the website, you'll see the About Us button. And when you click that, you'll see two options. And by clicking Our Work, it'll take you to information on all the programs. Their biggest program is the LYC, and it's what I'm on. So the LYC is made up of 15 youth counselors. They are elected to represent London's 14 wards plus Western. This year, however, the election was done a little differently because of the pandemic. Instead of having wards this year, we just had a general election in which every person who wanted to be on the council had to attain a certain number of votes. We didn't do wards this year because if we had done that, it would have been much harder to get votes specifically just from your ward because we weren't allowed to go door to door canvassing due to the pandemic. So after you've gone through the election process and have become a council member, there are a couple of things that council members are responsible for each year. Being on the council means you get a chance to discuss community issues, receive leadership training, and foster change in the city however you want. Throughout your term, you are responsible for planning an individual project, a group project, and leading the council through a council-led meeting on an issue that will and educate them on the issue. For example, this year I decided that for my individual project, I would set up Zoom meetings with the elderly in long-term care homes, seeing that they aren't allowed visitors and they're probably experiencing loneliness. So I wanted to do that to give them some company and cheer them up. For my group project, I, along with a couple other counselors, partnered to create the initiative Everyday Empowerment, which is a project that focuses on gender and youth empowerment. We have partnered with the local organization Champions of Change to create the Everyday Empowerment Program. We plan to host engaging monthly, virtual until it is safe to do so otherwise, programming with a rotating educational focus. Topics will spotlight gender empowerment, diversity and inclusion, leadership, social justice, activism and advocacy, business, STEM, post-secondary pathways, and career opportunities. This program aims to be a safe and inclusive environment to share, learn, and grow. We encourage participants to dream big and shoot for the stars. We recently had our first conference on March 9th in an honor of International Women's Day. Our topic for this month was speaking powerfully into empowerment. I'd say the night was a huge success. We got to hear from Michelle Baldwin, Samantha Krishnapillai, Liz Snellgrove, Erin Craven, Kanisha Aurora, and Kate Young. All their stories were very inspiring and motivating and our event was loved by all the attendees. We will continue doing monthly conferences on a variety of topics. So if you want to keep an eye out for the next one or simply learn more about our program, you can follow us at Everyday Empowerment underscore on Instagram. And I also have it on the screen right there. As for my counselor led meeting, I'm scheduled to present in May and after the recent increase in acts of racism and discrimination in our community, I'm thinking about doing my presentation focusing around that. So now that I've given you a little more information on Young London, LYC and my role as a counselor, I hope you'll be encouraged to find out more and participate in their amazing programs. We can go on to the next slide. Moving on, now let's talk about where my interest in environmental issues sparked from. I think nowadays when you see young people like me, with the exception of a couple, you don't expect them to show any interest in the environment. I think this is false. And if you talk to many young people, they care about the environment and the future of our world. The first time I started to think about environmental issues and grew interested in them was a couple of years ago when I fully started to understand how serious climate change and the impact of it can be if we don't do anything about it and turn our eyes away. This deeply scared me and to this day still does because even though there are some initiatives in place to minimize these issues, we still have a long way to go. It seriously scares me that there are world leaders or 
past world leaders who simply don't believe in climate change and the danger it brings if we continue to turn a blank face towards it. Although I can't do anything about the way world leaders think, I can step up to promote change in my own community and raise awareness so that people my age are educated about the severity of what's going on and what can be done to minimize the impact. This is partly the reason I chose to run for the LYC. I know it's a great platform to get my voice heard and lead projects that are centered around climate change. Although specifically in regards to environmental issues, this wasn't the best year to run as there is a global pandemic going on and events I would have liked to arrange can't be done because of the restrictions. Despite this, I plan to run again next year and hopefully things are better and I can make sure the events that I want to make are possible. I want us to really focus on these issues and lead projects to address them and change them. If it weren't for me reading the news, I don't think I would have ever understood the severity of these issues to get involved and speak up. And I don't think that much of our youth read the news, so it's our responsibility to educate them about this stuff and by other means. I'm so honored to be here today, but to be completely honest, I was very surprised when I was asked because I'm not proud of having done nothing to this point on this issue. Yes, I've addressed it, but now I need to turn my words into actions because words are nothing if you can't act on them. It deeply scares me when I hear about how glaciers and sea ice are melting, how the weather is getting weirder and weirder as the year goes by, the increase in pollution worldwide because of humans, animals going extinct or losing their homes are just some of the things that got me interested in environmental issues and motivated me to speak up and make sure people understand the severity of what we ourselves are doing to our planet. It amazes me how scientists are looking for other habitable planets to colonize on or destroy, as I read somewhere, rather than trying to fix what they've destroyed back here on Earth and come up with solutions to fix our planet. They have the money, and if they really wanted to change things around, the one thing this pandemic has taught me is governments most definitely can, if they're motivated enough, which is sad, but I don't think a lot of the high up there officials and important people understand the severity of their doing nothing. That's why I think it's very important to educate this new upcoming generation on environmental issues because we are the future of this world and for long lasting change, it's up to us to make a difference, which leads me to my next and final slide. Which is what are some things young people can do to help the environment and have a positive effect impact in their city. The number one thing that I cannot stress enough is to educate ourselves. If we don't know what the problem is or the severity of it, how will we be able to do anything about it? Many of today's youth simply do not know the extent of what's going on. Sure, we hear bits here and there through social media and word of mouth, but that isn't truly enough to care about something. I learn about things like math and stuff at school, but I'm not that passionate about those things. I think we have to teach our youth about this stuff, whether it be in school or elsewhere, but you need to sit them down properly and make sure they have your undivided attention so that they understand the importance and severity of the topic. I definitely think it can be incorporated into the curriculum, but in a way that is engaging and creative so as to make people actually want to learn more and step up and do something about it. I also think doing things, no matter how small you think they are, are still important, and if you can convince enough people to do them, they'll make a difference. Some things I think our youth could be doing is carpooling together instead of separately, avoiding the use of plastic where possible, not littering and putting the garbage where it belongs, making sure to recycle properly, Limit excessive use of paper products, buy clothes and products like skincare and makeup from brands that are uh, that are for working against minimizing the effects of climate change and cruelty free. And even thrift, thrift shopping is better than fast fashion, which a lot of teens have transitioned to this year, but we still have a lot of long way to go. And these are just a couple of things I think our youth can be doing to minimize the effects of environmental issues. Personally, when the weather starts getting nicer and if it is safe to do so, I would love to organize like a park cleanup led by youth in which we can gather in a specific area or a specific park to pick up trash just lying around. I sincerely think that a little goes a long way and by doing these small acts, we can have a big impact on how we shape the future. This brings me to the end of everything I have to say. I would once, I would once again like to thank you for having me here. It was a great experience getting to share my thoughts. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Rimsha. Um, that was a great presentation. Thanks for sharing all your all your thoughts and ideas. Um, I think we have time for a couple minutes for uh, some questions. So I'm just going to check our Q and A. Um, yes. So we have a question um, that asks, how can we adults support youth uh, to do the work so that so deeply affects your future? And where do youth organizations need support from, from adults? 
I think being there and being there as a support mechanism. So like someone like, you know, if when I'm like, I care some about an issue, I usually rant to it about about it with my mom. So she's always there. And like, she even like, so when she'll find like an article or something that like, you know, she thinks I'll find interesting or I want to find more about, she'll show it to me. So I think just being there and being there as a support mechanism, allowing us to like rant or vent, or if we want to come up with an initiative that will prevent this issue or minimize it, then give us your full support. And then what was the second part of the question? Yeah, the second part was where do youth organizations need support? I, from adults, I think it's just that whole organization because youth, we don't really have any experience, especially for the last year we've been in a pandemic, we've been stuck at home. So we don't really know how to organize events. We all like at school, teachers do it for you. So we don't have any actual experience of organizing events. So being there to mentor and guide how to go about organizing these events. Awesome. Um, and uh, one more question. Um, so in your in your presentation, you talked about um, all the different work that you've been doing with Young London, and it's um, obviously like shows how connected everything is and like the intersection between like the environment and race and all of that. Um, so this might be hard to, to pick one, but I'm wondering what what's one project or achievement that uh, you did with Young London that you're really proud of? For me so far, it would be the Everyday Empowerment Program, just because when we started it, we, we planned like a month prior to March, we weren't expecting that we would actually reach the deadline of when we were planning on having the conference, but then we did everything. And like having Kate Young speak at our event was huge. And we were, we just weren't expecting the turnout was great. We weren't expecting to accomplish what we did in one month. So I'm very proud of that. Awesome. So I think that's it for the Q&A. Um, and so now I'll pass it back to Singwan to uh, share some closing comments. So thank you to everyone who came out to our Green in the City event today. And thank you again to our speakers, Dr. Ellen Kelsey, Rimsha Ashraf, and Sunday Ajax. And we'll be sending the links mentioned throughout this presentation in a follow-up email if you're registered, so please stay tuned. And before we close the event, we have some wrap-up items. So get involved with the City of London's Climate Emergency Action Plan by visiting getinvolved.london.ca slash climate. And the City of London has recently launched a climate action planning simulator where you can learn more about how a climate action plan is developed and use the tools to create your own plan to meet the net zero by 2050 goal and use the link londonclimate.slo.net to participate. You can also find out about local environmental initiatives by attending our upcoming Green in the City event. Um, visit londonenvironment.net slash green underscore city to sign up. Our next event is actually happening March 23rd and we'll be learning about Ontario's first neighborhood powered by the sun from Sifton and West Five staff. We'd love to see you there. And you can also visit our website and sign up for our e-newsletter if you're not already signed up already. And that's the best way to get all upcoming environmental events and opportunities sent directly to you. So please sign up. And lastly, we'd like to thank all the supporters of the London Environmental Network. Thank you to all of you for joining us today on Zoom and on Facebook Live. We really appreciate it and we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.